last year, we all know that the world changed rather suddenly and our efforts doing child passenger safety work seemed to stop rather abruptly because up to that point, CPSTs mostly have been, had been doing their work in person. So, you know, before long, we started to eventually adapt to the new situation and some programs or even individuals kind of came up with ways to use technology to still reach out to people. And what we found was that virtual checkups do have their pros and cons, but by and large, they are actually really effective and efficient ways to teach caregivers. So now that we're actually opening up a bit more and most of us have resumed at least some in-person checkups, uh, Shaunaria and I really feel that this new virtual tool in our toolkit is you know, worthwhile to continue doing and it would really be short-sighted to just discard it entirely as we transition back. But instead, we really hope that people will see it as something that we're gonna have a, as a, having a place in our toolkit on an ongoing basis. So we have both ways that we can reach caregivers uh, as needed. So in today's presentation, we hope that we'll help you be successful when offering these kind of uh, virtual checks. And so our objectives by the end of this session, we want you to know how to communicate with caregivers before, during, and after a virtual education session. And then we want you to be able to identify the equipment that's gonna support you in that education. We're also gonna talk about the actual steps of the virtual checkup and include showing some video footage of a sample checkup, that'll be nice. And of course, naturally, we're gonna want you to know what resources are gonna be available for you going forward. And we hope that this session will have some value for all attendees, whether you've already tried doing some virtual checks or if this is something entirely new for you. If you look at the Safe Kids certification site and filter for techs, you can actually filter for those who provide virtual education. And I did that recently and found over a thousand people have actually gone to the site and marked that they'll give virtual education uh, just through that website. And, and that's probably only scratching the surface of the number of people who are actually offering virtual checks. So that's awesome to see so many people have taken advantage of this new way. And still, we're, we're gonna think, it's. It, we hope that it'll be great to have even more people added to this uh, as we go forward uh, rather than fewer. Because we really need to think about virtual checkups within that good, better, best framework. So while it's true that virtual checks are not for everyone and certainly no CPST should ever feel forced to do them, they should also not avoid them just because they think they're not as good as an in-person check. Instead, we kind of need to think of them more in that good, better, best for whatever situation you're in. So obviously during a pandemic or say when a CPST or even a caregiver, you know, if they live in a remote area, well, this might be the best education that we can get. And also within virtual education, there's going to be good, better, and best considerations. So back in the day, I used to do a lot of phone education, which was decent and useful education uh, between, you know, to, to offer. But clearly, virtual education, we add that video element to it, is going to be even better than just phone support. And, and then beyond that, there's ways to make that virtual education go from good to, to better and best. So just by adding things like props and doing some side-by-side -side teaching and some of the other tips that we're gonna give you, you can actually make that education a lot more valuable. So ha having a tech watch the screen and talk to a care caregiver through an activity, that's gonna be good, but adding enhancements for teaching can make it much better. And as I mentioned, virtual checks do have pros and cons, obviously, when compared to in-person. So these points should be recognized when you determine going forward which type of check you want to do. So when we have our options, and of course, virtual education is the clear winner when we don't have those options to be in-person, because if there's a pandemic, that's going to be a problem for in-person. Uh, and obviously, virtual is 100% risk-free when it comes to sharing germs. But even when there are no virus-related reasons not to do in-person, there are some advantages to virtual checks. So caregivers and, and CPST sometimes live in remote areas. So this is going to give them both better access to giving and, and receiving assistance. And the hours can be more flexible, too, for that matter. 
And I can imagine some locales where there's bad weather conditions for doing in-person checks in the dead of winter, for instance, or maybe even in the summer in some areas where it gets super duper hot. Taking advantage of virtual options where their comfort be, can be considered is, is definitely going to be a viable way to handle reaching out to caregivers. Um, but from a more philosophical kind of adult learning perspective, we've really found that a major advantage to virtual education is assuring that the caregiver does all the, the hands-on work. And I can tell you for myself personally that it can sometimes be really hard not to get in there and, and, and do the adjustments to the car seat or even do the installation yourself. And so, you know, with this setup, there is no way that that's going to happen. They're for sure going to have that experience. Um, and, you know, naturally on some occasions it can be a little frustrating when there's a particular step, for instance, that's hard for the caregiver to do, but would be easier for us to do. So I have definitely had that one. I had one time where I was helping and the, the crotch strap needed to be adjusted inward for a newborn baby because it was a used car seat. And I know I could have done that pretty quickly, but this caregiver struggled for about a half hour while I was on a virtual check with them. And I, I talked to another tech recently who had a similar kind of situation where the latch hooks were attached and he could not get those J hooks undone, whereas we could have stepped in and done that in an in-person session. But by and large, that's a, that's a more rare situation. And you know what, you get through it and it's okay. It's certainly as frustrating as those sometimes situations can be, the overall situation of that learning that they can get from doing it themselves and making the adjustments themselves certainly um, shouldn't be overshadowed by these occasional frustrations. It's definitely worthwhile for them to do this virtual education. Um, and another con, of course, could be potential language barriers. Sometimes when we don't feel confident that someone understands what we're saying, it helps if we show, right? But these also can be overcome with some planning with what you're doing with virtuals. And in fact, we've actually found some real good success using translation services with virtual checks in some situations where it, in, you know, it would have been impossible to do that on the spot in the in the in-person setting that we were in, but we could make arrangements to do that virtually. So in that sense, I'd say better access to translation service would be a potential pro. Uh, but CPST and caregiver access to technology, now that's a, a con that really does need to be considered. And even that though, I'd say since the beginning of the pandemic, that was a big concern for us at first, and we anticipated a lot more problems than we'd actually found. And Shanaria will talk to you a little more about that in a moment. Um, but among the inequities of the pandemic that, that we've learned, um, one definitely is, you know, for sure the unevenness of internet services across communities. So that's definitely true. So just like with in-person events, going forward, being mindful that there are areas and groups that might not be reached because they just don't have access to either the right technology device, or maybe they don't have suitable connectivity to do it, it's going to be important to keep keeping that in mind. But again, adding virtual checks is only going to enhance the various ways that we can teach more people. So the ideal will be having both in-person and virtual tools available. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Shaunari, and she's going to talk more about technology. Thank you, Denise. Uh, COVID has shown us how powerful technology can be and really has offered us an opportunity to be more imaginative with how we might use digital education in the future. Um, when we first went virtual, we literally were scrambling to find the appropriate platforms and learn how to use them to try to push out information and education as quickly as possible. Um, this wasn't always successful, um, but we've learned a lot along the way. Some platforms like Zoom, for instance, rose to the challenge. They quickly um, got together and they increased safety and security and added new features that made the Zoom um, experience a lot um, more um, user-friendly and it allowed us to um, expand how we were teaching and offering education. Today, we have a whole host of virtual options to choose from, which we will talk about and most people will have access to at least one of those options through their smartphone, tablet, or their laptop. Now, what options you choose are completely up to you. 
Um, you're going to choose what you feel most comfortable with. For me, on my online check request form, I uh, have three options. And I put the option that I would most like uh, people to sign up for at the top. That's my preferred method, which is Zoom. So I offer Zoom, FaceTime, and Other. When a caregiver selects Other, that's a required field where they have to put in the application or app that they're most comfortable with. And then it's up to me as the technician, whether or not I feel comfortable um, with using that app as well. And then maybe there's gonna be some negotiation that happens. So FaceTime, Zoom, Facebook Messenger, Skype, WhatsApp, Duo, Google Duo, WebEx and Tango are just some of the apps that um, we see now. Now, this is not an inclusive list. Um, there are many more to choose from. I would say FaceTime and Zoom are the two most popular apps that people ask for. Um, and they both have their advantages and they both also have their limitations. WhatsApp app is a really popular one with our communities um, that might have um, families in other countries, and so they use that app a lot, as do um, some of our Head Start programs and some of our other child-related programs um, across the area where we live. So I think it's really important that as a technician, um, we're familiar with all the apps that are available out there, but maybe we just choose two or three that we're most comfortable with that seem to be the same apps that our community is asking for. And we learn those apps and become more comfortable with them so that we can um, meet the needs of our community and work in, within their comfort level as well. So definitely don't feel like you need to become an expert on all the apps that are listed here. So when it comes to technology, um, there's going to be some challenges and we wanna make sure that we at least have the minimum amount of resources available to us so that we can be successful in a car seat check. Um, first and foremost, both on the technician side and on the caregiver side, a reliable internet connection or signal is paramount to a successful car seat check. Um, if you don't have a good connection, the car seat check is not going to be able to move forward smoothly. And this is where that in-person check would be more preferred. Um, in this picture here, you see um, kind of a trio of technology equipment that you might want to consider. There's the large computer screen, there's the laptop, and then there's a headset. Um, when it comes to sound quality, typically um, voice through a headset is clearer and easier to understand. Also, headsets um, minimize distractions and background noise. Um, but a lot of laptops have good sound quality through the embedded microphone as well. Having a large screen is great, but it doesn't always have the best picture quality. And sometimes you get a better picture quality on a phone or a tablet. So you can have all the things, or you can just have one thing, which is the laptop, and you can be equally as successful. So we're still looking at that good, better, best model. So, you know, good is having the laptop, better might be having the second screen and best might be also adding the headset. Um, it's really important that for your caregivers who are most likely using a smartphone or a tablet, that they are able to man the camera but also have their hands free at the same time, which is impossible, right? They can't do both. So in that instance, we will um, encourage the caregivers to have a second person um, someone holding the camera while the other person is making the adjustments to the car seat as needed. Now, we know that there's a lot of moving parts, especially when it comes to technology, and that just adds one more layer for our technicians to be able to be successful in a car seat check. So we recommend enlisting a mentor or, you know, your partner in crime, your technician in crime, to join you and practice mock up the seat check and ask, you know, um, is my direction clear? Um, is where I'm telling you to put your hands on the car seat make sense? How could I do this better? Um, and get the feedback from that technician and it really will help both of you hone your skills so that you can um, create a positive experience for the caregiver. And most importantly, it's just practice. Um, and the more you do it, the more comfortable you will feel. Um, and then technology becomes less and less of a barrier. 
So now I'm going to head this off to Denise, and she's going to talk about what other tools you might want to have in your tool bag. Thanks, John Marie. Yeah, so just like any other check, you're going to want to gather up the supplies that you're going to need to make the check successful. And this is going to include virtual and physical items or electronic and phys physical items. And some of these you already have access to, and some of them maybe you don't, but it might be easier to get than you actually realize. So if you feel like pulling together the tools that I'm going to be talking about in the toolkit is a stumbling block for you for some reason, I would definitely recommend that you check with your state or local group coordinator because frequently there are supplies that you can get from them. So naturally, you're going to need to have some sort of a device, a computer, tablet, um, laptop, or phone. Um, and you're going to want to, beyond that, of course, access the owner's manuals for the car seat and the car. And based on whatever the actual person you're going to be meeting with has told you, and I'm going to tell you in a minute about how to get that information gathered. But there are other basic tools that you really should always have. Um, and that might be hard copy or digital versions. Like you're gonna wanna have access to a recall list. You can check for recalls just like you normally would, a latch manual. And of course, um, you could access your CPST technician guide. And it's always a good idea to go to the manufacturer's website for the car seat and just check out their FAQs and see if there's anything helpful there, possibly bookmark that so you can share it with the caregiver during the check. And importantly, you're gonna wanna have a checkup form. Okay, so I like to use the national digital um, check form, the one online, because then it's, you know, it's easy to fill out since I'm right here at my computer. And I don't end up piling up a bunch of paper. Um, and it's also actually really cool because when I do those, I'm making a, it, the system sets that up as all my checks and I can actually go into the digital uh, dashboard now and see a summary of all the checks I've done and it collects a lot of different misuse statistics for me and so it there's uh, a lot of tools that that creates but whether you're using a hard copy form or a digital form the point is you got a form you know this is not just because it's virtual does not mean we are not filling out the paperwork and documenting 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 just like we would for any other check so for the additional props you can use, I, I think that you can start simple uh, adding on. So you wouldn't even have to have these things, but it would actually really enhance the teaching if you do. So basically just having a car seat can be really helpful um, and having some dolls. So for instance, if you have a car seat, you can point to things like, you know, here's your latch system, things like that, that you can show them as well as during, especially for instance, with the, the child in the harness system, you can do side-by-side -side teaching so that you're doing something, they're doing something, they can, they can see and compare. Um, I've even heard of some techs doing side-by-side -side teaching for installation using an indoor demonstrator or even going out to a car, but um, it's certainly not essential to do that. Um, so I think you know, ideally, what I'd like to have is, if possible, you see I have a Kiko key fit here, and if I'm helping someone with a key fit, it's perfect if I can actually match up the car seat so we have the same model, but that's absolutely not necessary. You can certainly do a check that is with whatever car seat, as long as, you know, you can imagine there are lots of universal things about a harness in the terms of the retainer clip, in terms of just snugness and things like that, that would work on any car seat that you happen to have. Um, having a latch manual is also handy for a lot of reasons. I'll give you an example myself. My very first virtual check last March or April, I had gotten all prepared and I'd read the owner's manual for the car and the car seat and I was ready to go. And just right before I got, I thought, oh, I better check the latch manual. And so when I looked up the car in the latch manual, sure enough, it said that there was actually a recall on that car for uh, if used with a car seat with rigid latch and the car seat I was going to be working with, the family had a car seat with rigid latch. And so when I talked to them, they did not know about this recall. And so I was learned, I learned a lesson that you definitely still need to check the latch mail. And in fact, I've heard from a lot of people that it can be really useful. One of the things that's, that's very useful, I'll just give another example, is in the Appendix B model listings in the notes, it's going to tell you if there is a posting at our Safe Ride News website under Latch Gallery that you can go to to find pictures and examples and, and, and um, descriptive text for weird stuff. So if you see something that's that's hard, you know, to, to, 
describe or, or that you don't even have, you've, maybe you've never seen it and it's really unusual, you can go to the Latch Gallery at safefridaynews.com and find information that'll help you as well as you can share that with the person who might own that vehicle and find that kind of challenging. <laughs> And then beyond that is the fun part, I think. Um, you can get creative with props, right? So the sky's the limit. And I know there are a ton of very creative techs out there. And I know even for in-person checkups, I've seen you doing this stuff all, all the time. I think, for instance, of my colleague here in Washington State, Sue Emery has that Twinkie Physics for booster use. And lots of techs use mini skeletons to show the difference between rear and forward facing, what happens to the spine, or even just a string with beads on it, those kinds of things. All those things can be translated and used for your virtual check. So just be thinking how you can use those things in front of the camera to help make your points. But there are also some fun and new ideas that are really mostly, even mostly suited to uh, this virtual setting. And this is just one example I'm showing. One of the techs on my team had this neat idea to take a, a expired car seat, take the harness off of it and put it on a doll. And so what that does for us, of course, I can show harness use on this doll, but I'm then I'm tipping the car seat up and doing stuff like that. And if I instead have an alternative method, I can do a lot of things by actually showing where the clip goes. And as you can see, Tina here is showing how the harness the pinch test works so she can even actually hold her device her cell phone while she does that and put this right up to the camera so this doesn't do everything for us it doesn't help with showing how to tighten it up but it certainly shows how it lays across the body and it can do a lot that is a lot easier to move around so that's just one example of some props that would be um, useful and you know it's just up to you uh, if you come up with some and if you do Definitely share it with the rest of the community, however you put it online or however. Um, I think it's great to share those ideas as much as we can. Um, I'll share with you guys too. One thing I like to do is, I'm not, as you can see, I'm not out of a car. I don't have a demonstrator, but you can do a lot with just a piece of, of seatbelt webbing. And I like to get one that's not black because I usually things are too dark. And so something light piece of seatbelt webbing, this can be used to show how a belt path works, but it can also be surrogate for a, a strap. So if I'm trying to teach at or below the shoulders or at or above, you can clearly see that just on my body with the seatbelt. So I might not need to do this if I'm in person, but if I'm working with someone online, this can be a really useful thing to show. And then also don't forget to get creative with the technology too. So um, you can consider that when most of these platforms that Shaunari talked about there is the option to share the screen. And so um, if you use that share screen function, you can pull up the owner's manual, you can go over the FAQs, but you can also imagine how you could use video to be useful. So if it's something you want to get across, and don't worry, you get copies of this at PDF, so you'll be able to get these um, sites, but you know there are many, many sites that have videos for us, and you can share those with the public, with the person you're working with. So whether that's someone doing a really great job explaining the difference between staying rear-facing or transitioning to forward-facing, or you know any of those videos that are part of the certification curriculum, those are available for our use anytime after that class, and those are at the, NC, at the National CPS Board website. Um, and then there are lots of things that... Um, are really hard to, harder to show virtually than in person. And so one of those, for instance, is European belt routing. And so at the Safe Ride News website, I have a video that is just a few minutes long that shows that particular technique. So you can actually show that or send them a link to look at it after the check. So now let's transition to talking about communicating with the details with the caregivers. So that is, you know, with an in-person setting, you can do something as simple as go into a parking lot, set up a tent, put out a sandwich board, and then just see who shows up. We can't do that with virtual, right? We have to, to set things up a lot better than that. So um, you need to not only set up your time and what platform you're going to be using, but beyond that, you're also going to want to set up the expectations. So they need to know that they're going to be doing hand, you know, doing all the hands-on clearly. But they also need to know that this isn't a situation where they're going to walk up and you're going to do all the work. 
they're going to need to have already taken the car seat out of the box. They're going to have to try to install it themselves and have read the manual. So this isn't a situation where you're going to be able to just wing it that way. We're all going to have to do some preparation. We're going to prepare as CPSTs and we need to set the expectation that they will, as the caregiver, also do some prep before we meet up. And so you can do that communication in a lot of ways. You can do the registration and set up communication in many ways. Uh, I even work with a hospital that still has a phone bank to take registrations and they can do that. And you can also set up online ways to register using digital forms, using sign up software and things like that. But when the pandemic started, this was, you know, we needed some basic ways to start setting this stuff up. And so I just developed a set of PDFs that is you know supposed to be some tools that should help people do this and here in my state the washington traffic safety commission helped me out and set it up so that they made them look good and so we developed those materials and those are now you can find them on the safe ride news website but you can also find them here at this uh at the certification site which this should be very familiar to you if you go to where the first arrow at top is the resources faqs you're going to find a lot of FA, a lot of resources that you're probably familiar with but if you scroll down to other there's a full set of resources and this is good to know about generally uh, for specific to virtual um, education, but there is a button that I'll talk about next that is for these tools from Safe Ride News. So if you click on that button, you'll go to that page at Safe Ride News under resources that I was mentioning. And what you're going to find there are three um, tools that you can, you know, use however you want, modify if needed. One's a guidance sheet, one's a pre-check form, and one's an email template. I'll talk about each of these three things, but I wanna also point out that they are available in Spanish. Thank you very much to the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. So um, starting with the guidance sheet. So a year ago, none of us really even knew what a virtual check was. We had to think it through philosophically, what is a virtual check? So this is a form that is specifically for your text. So this isn't to hand out to the public so much as this is a training tool to make them think, oh, okay, I am taking all my principles of learn, practice, explain. I am still applying my document, document, document principles, and I'm still getting a liability release before I start doing the check. So, and then having the idea of that we, you know, follow-up resources are a good idea. So this is all just giving them some background of what it means to do a, a virtual check as guidance. And please note on this form, as well as the others that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, uh, these are have been made to be templates that are general. And if you wanna use these and add your logo to it, there's space, we took our logo off the top, the blue part, and you can add that to the bottom if you want. So the other resource that's really helpful is that pre-check form. And this is kind of the heart of these resources because you need to know what car seats are gonna be coming, you, uh, what the child's characteristics are, what the car is going to be, but also you need to get that hold harmless agreement from the parents. So this is gonna be a, a PDF, but we made it fillable so that you can email this uh, as an attachment to the caregiver and they can save it to their computer and then fill it out on their computer, save it, and then email it back to you. Now, if that's hard for somebody to do, they don't have the capability of doing that, they certainly can um, also print it out, fill it out by hand, and then scan it and send it back. So that's fine as well. And so if you go back one, please. On the second page of that form is where you're going to find that hold harmless agreement. So still, that's going to be important. And one of the key reasons that you're going to want to have this whole, the, the rest of the form is important because you want to gather this information, but you do need to get that hold harmless agreement so that you're all set to go, just like you would be in person. So um, you can see here, it just is, like I said, could be filled out on the computer. They type in their name they add their phone and the date, and then they just check the box to say, I agree. For my program, that's perfectly fine. Some places are gonna require an actual signature, like some hospitals may need an actual signature. So again, they can print it off, sign it by hand, scan it and send it back. Or even some places have a, a ability to 
have the account to do electronic signatures. So that can also be added here. So if you have your own hold harmless, this is a modified um, Safe Kids hold harmless agreement, but you're perfectly welcome to strip that out and put in whatever hold harmless agreement you want to use. So that's perfectly fine. So lastly, uh, the last resource uh, that I'm going to talk about is going to be sample e uh, language for emailing the caregiver during this whole process, right? Because you can't just, you know, send an email that has this pre-check form. They're going to want to um, get this information in an email. So careful communication before and then after the check is going to be really, really helpful. So what you're going to find in this email template is, again, suggestions, right? This is a start for what we would think would be needed. You can copy this out and put it into the body of an email and edit it as you wish for what's more appropriate for you. So in that, there's going to be three templates. In the first one, you're going to be, is where you're going to send it out offering the dates and sending the pre-check form and asking about what format they want. Then the second email template is going to remind them, you know, they're going to say, say remind them of the date we've picked. It's going to remind them of their um, agreement that they're going to read the manual and do the checkup um, and do the installation on their own as well and have tried that. And if the baby isn't born yet, make sure they found a doll or a stuffed animal so that they can actually do harness use. Um, and then there's a third template for after the check. So the kinds of things you might want to say in that follow-up email. So the idea here is if you want, you could copy this or you could edit it uh, however you want. So basically it's just a way to help people save time. So they're not reinventing the wheel, but they can, can make those changes as needed. So those are the key elements to setting up a virtual check and the tools that are gonna help you do that. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Shauna Ree and she's gonna talk about how to actually get started doing these checks. All right, so part of the premise of doing a virtual car seat check is the preparation. So um, the more prepared you are, the more successful you'll be. But now we've prepared, we've gotten all the background information, we're set up with all the technology and props that we need. It's finally time to do an actual car seat check. So let's get started. So we know that um, the instructions are really important, and so we want to make sure we have access to those instructions before we meet with the families. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I like to create an Outlook invite for myself, and I will include information from the pre-check form in the Outlook invite, and I will attach my manual. I'll make note of the latch manual pages that I want to refer to. Um, and then I'll make any other notes that um, I want to make sure that I remember to cover when I'm talking to the caregiver. Because I probably made this appointment, you know, two weeks ago and my memory is not that great. So I'll plug all that into my Outlook invite. And then that way, if I'm running late for my appointment, um, all I have to do is open it up in my calendar and it's all ready and waiting for me there. So that preparation is really key to your success. Another thing that's really important is confirming with the caregiver that they have a hard copy of their instruction manual. Um, and you wanna make sure that they have that so they can do a good job installing their car seat, but also because you're gonna be referring to it during your seat check. Now, sometimes um, they say, yes, they do. And we get to the actual virtual appointment and the instruction manual disappeared somehow, and now they don't have access to it. So I like to always include in my emails to them before the car seat check, a link to the manual as well. So that way I know that they're looking at the same manual that I am, because sometimes they will go to the internet and download a manual on their own, and then we're not always looking at the same thing. So when I say go to page six of your manual, I know that their page six matches my page six, and we're talking about the same things. So having that quick link and um, sent out to your caregivers as well is really handy, and it really saves you a lot of time in the long run. Now, if for some reason all of that didn't come together, this is where that share screen functionality would come in handy, because you could share your screen to show page six of the manual, um, especially if there's a picture in there that might help get what you're trying to explain um, out a little bit better. 
So we're all set and we have all of our manuals um, in front of us. Now we're going to actually start the car seat check. Um, I always tell people to start by introducing yourself, maybe have some sort of an icebreaker. I like to either make mention to the weather, like, gosh, it's so nice you could be inside your garage because it's raining today. We live in the Pacific Northwest, so that's very common. Or if the baby's um, available, you know, who doesn't want to hear how cute their baby is? So just creating a little bit of rapport before you start um, the car seat check. Now, some techs like to follow the car seat check form from top to bottom so they don't miss anything. And some of us are a little bit more free and can start pretty much anywhere, but we always get to uh, checking all the boxes by the end of our seat check. So it's really up to you and your individual um, likes and how you're most comfortable. And make sure that you practice kind of all of this before going live. And remember that enlisting that mentor is a really important part of um, feeling comfortable and being successful, especially in the early days of the seat check. So we do have a video that we're going to show you here. It's just a short um, way for us to show kind of the beginning, the middle, and the end of a car seat check. Because of course, we're not going to you know, show you a full 30 to 60 minute car seat check um, in the presentation today. Um, it's really important that um, you have a, a good introduction and a good closing, because that's really um, the meat of what we're doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video. And this is Jenny. She's one of our Washington uh, child passenger safety uh, technicians. She's awesome. And then this is Eric. He is our caregiver. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. My name is Jenny and I'm a car seat technician and I'm really excited to be able to help you today. Nice to meet you, Jenny. So this is just an example of the introduction that, um, that you know, would kind of set the tone for the car seat check. As you can see, Eric kind of takes a breath after saying, nice to meet you, Jenny. So this allows Jenny to kind of start with the car seat check and direct it in whatever direction she's willing to go. Now, sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes our caregivers are really excited and they launch right into questions. Um, and that's okay too. So we just want to be able to meet them where they are and be able to be flexible. Now Jenny's going to instruct um, Eric to flip his phone so that she can get a view of the car seat. And this is where you might need some further instructions because you wanna make sure you can actually see the car seat. Otherwise your car seat check's not gonna go anywhere. So let's get started. Usually the first question we'll ask is, is the car seat purchase new? Yes, it was. Great. And do you have the car seat installed today? Yes, I do. All right, let's take a look at how the car seat is installed. So if you wanna flip your camera around, we'll take a look at um, how you installed your car seat. Did you use the lower anchors or the seat belt? I use the lower anchors. Okay, great. It looks like you have them attached there, so that looks great. Now let's check to see how secure your car seat is. So somewhere at the belt path, so where the car seat is installed, can you grip onto the car seat and try to pull the car seat side to side? All right, that looks like it's nice and secure. The key to a snug installation is uh, the car seat shouldn't move more than an inch side to side or front to back, so that looks great. The next thing we'll check is the recline angle. So somewhere on your car seat, there should be a recline angle for rear facing. There it is. And it looks like you have it in the right angle. So that looks great. So Eric obviously has done his homework because he read his manual and he knows some of the terminology that Jenny's asking him to find the latch anchors and the recline ankle ang angle, which is all great. Not all caregivers are gonna be uh, that good. So having a car seat like Denise showed you earlier, um, in your home office or your office at your workplace so that you can actually move your camera and you can point to the parts and pieces on your car seat when you're trying to explain where you want them to place their hands or what part and piece you're trying to have them adjust. So all of that is really important to be able to have um, those visuals. Now, um, if we were needing Eric to take out his car seat and flip it over and start making a bunch of adjustments, you can imagine how hard that would be if he's also trying to hold the camera phone at the same time. So this is really where having that second person 
is really important. Now, um, now all the other things that we do in a car seat check would occur. Jenny would instruct on how to harness. She would ask them to bring their doll or their teddy bear out. Um, they would do side-by-side -side instructions. So Jenny would be showing how to harness on her car seat as the caregiver is doing the same on their car seat. And now we'll skip to the end of the car seat and we'll listen to how Jenny closes it out. That's great to hear. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Do you have any other questions? Not at this time. Thank you so much for the help, Jenny. Of course, we're always willing to help. So from here, what I'll do is I'll send you a follow-up email with some car seat information. It will also have our contact information as well. So if you have any questions in the future, we're always willing to help. Thank you again for meeting with me today. So that's just a little overview of how a car seat check may go. Um, and I think it's really good to be able to see it in action so that you feel more comfortable when you're um, doing the car seat check the first time. Now with any good car seat check at the end, we always provide a handout, additional educational materials. And we're just gonna do things a little bit different in the virtual world. And we're gonna email them those um, resources instead. If there's an area where they feel that you feel like they need a little extra instructions, then maybe adding some links to the manufacturer's website um, would also be a great idea. So because we've been doing this for over a year now, we have come up with some other tips and tricks that we would like to share. Um, so we, we can't say it enough, having two people is really important, um, but you can certainly do it with just one. I've had people had to set their phone down, make the adjustment, pick it up, show me, set it down again, readjust it. Um, it works out, it just takes a little longer. Um, the car should be on a flat surface, a surface and you should have adequate lighting. These are things that I addressed in my pre-check email. Also, um, you wanna make sure that when you are providing instruction and you're using that manual, um, you're doing it in a way that you're giving them uh, information and education and making them comfortable with using the manual. So after the seat check, if they come up with a question, maybe they're going to go to the manual first to find the answer before reaching back out to you. So we're really practicing and mirroring what we want them to do in the future. We talked about shadowing or having a mentor. Uh, make sure that you know, if you're not comfortable doing a car seat check, you might sit in on a couple and just see how it's done um, until you feel comfortable doing it on your own. And then again, those follow-up emails are really important. Um, it's kind of a closure of the service that you've provided. Um, there's a lot of tools and um, virtual resources out there for technicians um, to include the Safe Kids certification page. And um, Denise has mentioned Safe Ride News and of course, CPS Board. These should all be websites that we are all familiar with as, as certified car seat technicians and instructors. And then for our families, oops, excuse me, we have the Ultimate Car Seat Guide. Um, there's a great online class, Car Seat Basics, through the CPS board. And then, of course, the manufacturers, YouTube channels, and websites. Um, don't forget about the power of classes, especially now that we're in this virtual world. Um, you can teach 30 to 50 people in an hour, or you can do one and a half car seat checks in an hour. Classes are a powerful tool to teaching our caregivers how to safely use their car seats. And for those that take the class and then follow up with a car seat check, they are way more successful and prepared than someone who has not attended a class. And then I'll hand it off to Denise. Thanks so much, Shanari. I hope that what we've presented so far will help you in the work you're doing, providing virtual checks, or maybe convince you to start doing them. Uh, but once you are doing them, another issue is how do you let people know that you're available for that? So you may have a group in your community. You may have... Um, methods in your community to, to direct people to you. But another way you can do that is to use the virtual tech sign up at the NHTSA website. Uh, as you can see, a caregiver or anybody can go to the child passenger safety page at NHTSA.gov and under installation help, they can filter for their city or state or zip code. And this was a filter for the state of Washington. You can see all those little blue pins are showing where there are technicians or programs that will do virtual checks so you can find people near you. So if you want to be one of those little blue pins and or your program, 
Uh, you can do that by contacting your state coordinator for CPS and they can have you added to that site. Uh, you can also, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, next slide, you can sign up for the page at the Safe Kids certification site as well. So like I mentioned, there's over a thousand people if you filter for that virtual education. And so you can go to your own profile and click on virtual education if you're willing to do virtual checks. So those are just two ways that the, that the public could find you. Now you could do virtual checks without doing either of those things, and that's fine too. Or you could do either or or both. So it just depends on what you want to do in terms of uh, people finding you. And lastly, there is also, because this has become so popular, uh, a national virtual check event series that's occurring. Those are offered quarterly. The first one was last year for Seat Check Saturday in September, and it was so successful that this year they've, they're putting on once every quarter. We just had one last weekend. And that's just a way that you can um, get your car seat checked virtually by a technician anywhere in the country by a technician who might be anywhere in the country. So there's a place that's listed here where caregivers can go to sign up to get a check and you can sign up to be one of those checkers if you go to this website. So for the upcoming one, certainly there's gonna be one on the seat check Saturday. We certainly urge people who are doing virtual checks to get involved nationally doing uh, car seat checks virtually as well.